I've done over 30 game jams in the past 10 years. To give you a sense of what we're going to cover today, here's a look at the final game. It's similar to an endless runner mixed with a rhythm game. The main character is constantly running while music plays and your interactions with the environment are set to the beat of the music. The theme of this game jam was mischief. The game jam was done in December of 2022 with my jam team members, Weston Mitchell, Jessica Mitchell, Mike Yacklin. A shout out to them, and I'll leave a link to some of their socials in the description if you want to give them a follow on Twitter. As I mentioned, the theme was mischief, and we wanted to like figure out a way to really interpret that theme. And we landed on the, on the idea that there would be a high school rebel running through the halls of a high school causing a total ruckus. One of the reasons that we landed on this idea is that it really focused on the strengths of our team. There are four of us. Two artists, one musician, and myself as the programmer. A music rhythm runner would have lower programming requirements, be able to make use of the fact that half of our team were artists, and in a game jam, you don't always have a dedicated music and audio team member, but this style of game requires one. So we wanted to capitalize on the opportunity that we had a dedicated music composer on the team. Let me take you along on the journey as though we were building the game together. All of the assets, including the character model and the animations, the environment art, and the music were all made by my teammates during the jam. In this video, I'll focus on the work I was closer to, the design and programming that we needed in order to make this rhythm runner. We'll need a way to lay out the path the player will take through the world, tools to create the level in the environment, and objects in the world that the player can interact with. One of my first rules in doing a game jam is to try to get to some form of a first playable as quickly as possible. If your game isn't playable, it's easy to flounder in a state where you don't know how your game is shaping up. It also makes it really hard to prioritize the different tasks. If you can get to a first playable quickly, then make the changes you need to be fun, you can continue adding to the game while making sure the game is fun all the way along. This is going to maximize the chance that your jam will be fun at the end. For this game jam, let's define first playable as having the player run along a curve that is specified by a series of points. We won't worry about the environment yet for the first playable or any of the interactions that the player makes. We're just going to focus on following a beat path. Let's get started. A fun twist that could make our rhythm runner different than other rhythm runners would be if the player character could take an interesting path through the level. There was an old Sega Saturn platformer called Pandemonium that I really enjoyed back in the day. It featured a side-scrolling action, but it was also made in 3D space. It allowed gameplay in a 2D space while highlighting the visual interest of a 3D level. Since this is a rhythm runner, we need a way to track the player's movement through the world based on the beat of the music. To support this, let's do our level design by placing markers in the world that represent where the player will be standing on every beat of the music. We'll call these beat markers. A beat marker can be placed inside the level and for every beat of the music, the player will run along that step. To create an interesting three-dimensional space like in that Pandemonium game, we would accomplish this by placing the beat markers along a curve. We can lay the beat markers out and as the player is running, Rather than simply going between the beat markers in straight lines, we could interpolate into a smooth curve that follows along the beat markers. In order to create that smooth curve, we'll use what's known as a Bezier curve, or in this case, a series of Bezier curves. If you've ever used a drawing program like Photoshop or Illustrator, you're already familiar with Bezier curves. The common case is that you have four control points that dictate the shape of the curve. The curve passes through the first and fourth points. The second and third points act sort of like stretchy handles that pull the curve in the direction that the handle is being uh, located. We apply this logic to the path that we want to draw. Let's say we have a beat marker and we want to create a nice smooth curve around it. So the approach that we're going to take to have that Bezier curve is to add four control points around every beat marker. Two control points will go before and two control points will go after. We want the path that the player takes to be a continuous curve. So it's important that the end of one curve is the beginning of the next. For this reason, we'll place the first control point directly in between our previous beat and our current beat. Similarly, we'll place our last control point between the current beat and the next beat. In this way, if we repeat this logic along every beat marker, then the Bezier curves will form a final path that is continuous through all of these points. 
Finally, we can complete the Bezier curve by adding control handles that bisect the first and last control points. The code to create a Bezier curve from four control points you can Google on the internet. Here's the C-sharp code that I use to do it. Using these tools, we can now place beat markers in the world. You can see how a curve can be used to connect all of them together. Let's go ahead and place some beat markers, and you can see how quickly these localized Bezier curves can be used to interpolate a path. We can now have the character walk smoothly along the curve in the timing of the beat. We now have the tools that we need to place a bunch of control points into the world, and our first playable is complete. We can have a character that can run along a beat marker curve. The next step will be to figure out how to author the environment art for our levels. In order to have maximum flexibility, let's construct the level from a series of smaller level pieces. In this jam, we'll use a straight hallway piece, a hallway with stairs going up, a hallway with stairs going down, and two curving pieces, one that curves to the right by 30 degrees and one that curves to the left by 30 degrees. Once we have all of these pieces, we'll need a way to connect them to each other in the world that doesn't require positioning them by hand. We can do this by inserting known geometry reference points inside every level piece. We're gonna go ahead and place two hard points, one for the entry and one for the exit. We'll call these hard points HP entry and HP exit. To make sure that every hallway piece is connected to each other, I'll have a Unity component called Level Geometry Snapper. This component will allow us to inform the game how pieces are connected together. The code can line them up perfectly and have them snap together like Lego. This piece of C-sharp code grabs the position and rotation of the exit on one piece and then repositions the current piece so that the HP entry snaps correctly to the HP exit of the previous piece. Now, building the level is just a matter of adding an environment piece to the world, adding the next piece to the world, and then connecting them together using our component. We can also add a convenience button with using the Unity editor commands that allow us to snap two pieces together with a single click. The code for this convenience button is just a few lines. We'll add the pieces together and snap. Add another and snap. By using these entrance and exit hard points, we can get the position and rotation of our pieces to go up, down, make turns. We'll be able to build all of our levels this way. So we're making great progress. We can snap together all the pieces of the hallway and we can place beat markers. The last step to make the level work is to allow the player to have actions to perform with the music. To handle this, we'll create an object called a beat interactable. The idea here is that we'll have different conditions of what the player is supposed to do when they reach a beat interactable. This is where some of the fantasy of the game would come in. What types of actions do we want the player to be able to do? For this jam, my team decided the player would have three actions, a jump, a slide, and an interact. We can capture the player's input and toggle these three different states, jump, slide, interact, and set flags on the player model to indicate whether the player is jumping, sliding, or interacting. One of the really cool things about having these flags on the character is that in addition to being able to give the player points, like score, when they're doing the correct action, we can also use the Unity animation system to watch these flags and play different animations based on these states. Here's a look at an animation controller that is set to play different animations on the character based on the state of these flags. Notice that as the player presses the different slide, jump, and interact keys, the flags on the controller change, and then the animation state machine updates the animation that the player's avatar is playing. We can have a super rich set of animations based on the transition between all these different states. Let's get back to creating those interactions. In addition to a beat interactable, we can author another Unity component called the beat aligner to ensure that the interact object is positioned directly on top of a beat marker. Some convenience buttons would allow us to move the interactable along the path of the song using next and previous buttons. Finally, some checkboxes would allow us to specify whether we expect the player to be jumping, sliding, or interacting when they reach that beat of the song. Okay, so here's a seemingly small but important question. How should the level and music be designed, or what order? Should the music be composed first, and then the level can be designed based on the music? Or should the level be designed first and then the music can be composed to match the level flow of the level? I encourage you to think about that for a moment. What would you do? If you compose the music first, then you could place elements of the level that match the music. 
On the other hand, if you design the level first, then the music composition would have to be constrained by the exact way that the level is laid out. My recommendation is that we should compose the music first. This is for a few reasons. First, music has a really rich set of properties that can be manipulated. There's the volume, the cadence, the tempo, the instrumentation, the density of notes. There's so much going on in music composition that goes into making music interesting. The level design, on the other hand, although it's difficult to do well, it has less variables that are being manipulated. For the purposes of this game, we have the curvature of the hallway, sliding up and down the stairs, interacting with the environment, and jumping. Although there are, you know, quite a few options that are at the player's disposal, it's still kind of a small number compared to the vast texture and variety in music when it's being created. There's also a much richer body of knowledge, accumulated knowledge over centuries on what makes good music. And we want to be able to apply all those lessons that have been developed over these thousands of years to make the interesting music. As a side benefit, it's easy to imagine that when the level design is trying to follow the musical design, the level design will actually inherit some of the structural rules that make music interesting. So if the music composed and our interaction is defined, we can place our interaction markers along the music track and reward the player with points for correctly jumping, interacting, or sliding at all of the appropriate times. Finally, we can spruce the level up with some additional environment art that our fantastic artists have made for the game. Here is a fly-through of the second level. As you can see, you can really decorate the place with extra students, soda machines, and other props. These all add to the cool high school hallway feel of the game and add some background visual interest as the player is playing. If you have an Android phone, you can download an APK of the final game using this QR code. Otherwise, I'll drop a link to the web playable version of the game in the description below. And now, let's watch a playthrough of level two of the Game Jam game, Out of Class Rebel, shown now in its entirety. Well, thank you for joining me on this Game Jam overview. This channel is devoted entirely to video game development. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments section and I'll respond directly. Happy game making.